Good morning. The Lord be with you. Let's begin as usual with prayer. We come to you, God, because we need your guidance and your help to live, but also to understand as much as we need to. So be our teacher, guide us in this study of the book of Esther, we ask in your holy name. Amen. So, uh, last time in the video, uh, last Monday, we finished Esther chapter 2. We did not get very far into chapter 3, although the in-person group got into chapter 3 last week. So let's begin at the end of chapter 2, where Mordecai uh, discovered a plot against the king, and he reported it to Esther, and Esther told the king. And it was recorded uh, in the book of the annals in the presence of the king, and the two conspirators were killed, and that's where chapter 2 ended. And that's going to come up later in, in today and be important in our study for today. So then into chapter 3. Uh, for whatever reason, Haman gets promoted by King Ahasuerus to second in the kingdom. That's where chapter 3 begins. It notes that he is an Agagite, uh, and if you go back to 1 Samuel, you'll find that uh, the Ag Agagite means Amalekite. King Agag was an Amalekite. Um, king Saul fought against him, disobeyed God, and kept the king alive, and kept the booty from the battle alive, uh, for the well-being of the people. They took all the profit they could from it, against what God had told them to do, apparently, at least what they thought God had told them to do. I'm not always sure that those passages where God uh, initiates uh, a holy war against other nations in which every man, woman, child, and animal is killed, I'm not always sure that that's what God actually did. It's what some people thought God did when the text got written down. We can disagree about that. Uh, if you want. But uh, here, uh, Mordecai, Haman, Haman gets uh, advanced to a prominent place in the kingdom. It identifies him as an Agagite, which means he's an Amalekite, which means he's a historic enemy of the Jews, going back at least to the time of Samuel, if not earlier. Some people trace it, the Malachites, even back to Esau. And so it goes back even to the, the two sons of Isaac, Jacob and Esau, and their conflict. The readers of the text in the Hebrew tradition would know this. So Haman has just been honored by the king to be second in command in the kingdom, and everybody bows down to him uh, except Mordecai. But Mordecai, verse 2 of chapter Three, did not bow down or do obeisance to Haman. And this really ticked off Haman. And he became angry with Mordecai and decided that since he was a Jew, Haman decided that all the Jews would be punished. All the Jews would be destroyed. All the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. And he was going to see that it got done. And so the... Next scene in verses 7 and following of chapter 3 is the casting of the lots or the poor, P-U-R, which is the basis for calling the festival at which this story was read, Purim, uh, is based on this uh, casting of the lots to decide which month in, in, on which the destruction of the Jews would take place. The actual letter uh, that King Ahasuerus is said to have written to the whole kingdom was actually written by Haman. And Haman, on behalf of the king, gave uh, a rationale in verses 8 and following to the king for why the Jews should be destroyed. They don't really keep your laws. They're so different from other people. We can't tolerate difference, can we? 
No, they don't obey the laws of the people. And he didn't say, of course, that they don't bow down to me. But he don't. They say he says to the king, they don't keep your laws, so you shouldn't really tolerate them. It's not good for the kingdom. If it pleases the king, why don't you issue a decree for their destruction? And I'll actually pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those in charge of the king's affairs so that they can put it into the king's treasury. One of our uh, members of the Monday study group in person commented that uh, this would take the place of the tax revenue that would be lost if the Jews were destroyed. And that uh, may be in the minds of uh, in the mind of Haman and the writer of this uh, this story. So the king said, oh, sure, that sounds like a good idea. Um, the Persians didn't usually operate that way. The Persians were very tolerant of people in their empire. But in this story, the king simply goes along with uh, almost what anybody suggests to him. And he is seen as a kind of wishy-washy character in the plot. Haman decides that the Jews are going to be destroyed, and the king says, that sounds like a good idea to me. And so the king gave his signet ring to Haman, and Haman wrote an, a, a decree in the name of the king to, to do the destruction of the Jews. And so the king's secretaries were summoned, and, a, and an official order was sent throughout, throughout all the kingdom that uh, the Jews should be destroyed on a certain day. Letters were sent in verse 13 by the couriers to all the king's provinces, giving orders to destroy, kill, and annihilate. How's that? Uh, that may take care of it, do you think? Kill, destroy, and annihilate. Um, obviously, an over uh, emphasis, an overkill, as it were, right? Uh, on all the women and children, the young and the old, the men, everybody on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to and to also to take everything that belongs to them, to plunder all their goods. Um, and so apparently this happened on the first of the month when the decree was issued, and it was going to be on the end of the year in the 12th month when uh, this would all be carried out. So we have a whole year, if you're Jewish, a whole year to think about the fact you're going to be killed on a certain day of the 12th month. And so the couriers were sent out throughout all the kingdom to, um, to disseminate this plot against the Jews and to, uh, to see that this order would be executed at the proper time. And Haman felt quite happy about that. He and the king sit down to drink at the end of chapter 3. But the whole city of Susa was thrown into confusion. That, that contrast is intended by the author to say that there's a tension building here that um, is going to have to be resolved somehow. So we get to chapter 4, and in chapter 4, Mordecai finds out about this plot of Haman's to destroy him and all the rest of the Jews in the kingdom of Persia. And so it causes Mordecai to put on sackcloth and ashes, and to go throughout the city wailing with a loud and bitter cry. That was disruptive. He went up to the king's gate. He can go no further, wearing sack sackcloth and ashes. He goes to the king's gate and he sits there. And not only does he mourn, but throughout all the king's provinces, there was a great mourning among the Jews, fasting and weeping and lamenting and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Again, a studied non-reference to God. God is not mentioned in the Hebrew version. In the Greek version, God is mentioned. But in the Hebrew version of Esther, God is not mentioned. Implied? Well, that's the question. Should we infer that God is intended here by the author? Is this one of those non-reference to God references, uh, it would seem so. But again, there's some reason that our author studiously avoids interjecting the name of God in any way in the text of Esther. 
Esther 4, 4 and follow him. So Esther hears that Mordecai is sitting in sackcloth and ashes at the gate of the king, and it's embarrassing. She, she sends out clothing to Mordecai. Why don't you put on something decent that he might take off this sackcloth and ashes, but he wouldn't accept the clothing that, that Esther had sent out. And so Esther called for Hatak, one of the king's eunuchs who was appointed to attend her, to go to Mordecai to say, what in the world's going on, Mordecai? What's happening? Why is this... Why are you dressed in sackcloth and ashes and mourning throughout the city in a, in a very public way? What's going on? So Hatak goes out to Mordecai in the square of the city in front of the king's gate. And Mordecai told him about the decree that all the Jews would be killed on a certain day. And the money that Haman had paid into the treasury of the king is kind of a bribe for the destruction of the Jews. And he gave, Mordecai gave to Hatak a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for the Jews' destruction, that he could show it to Esther. And not only show it to Esther, but explain it to her. This is what's involved here. And charge her. This is another thing Mordecai wants Esther to do. To charge her to go to the king make supplication to him and entreat the king for your people. That's throwing a lot of responsibility on Esther, barely a teenager. Well, she's probably a teenager. Maybe she's still uh, in her late teens, but she's just a kid, even though she's the queen, right? So what else can Mordecai do but appeal to her because she's in a position to do something about it. And so Hatak goes and tells Esther what Mordecai said. And Esther said to Hatak, uh, this may not work. Here, I want you to tell Mordecai this message. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if anybody goes into the presence of the king without being invited, there's one law, you die. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to somebody may that person go in and live. I myself have not been called in to see the king for a month. I'm not in a good position right now to have this influence that you want me to have over the king. And so they told Mordecai what Esther had said. This is really uh, interesting that these messengers are being sent back and forth between Esther and Mordecai. You know, why don't they just text each other? It seemed like that would be quicker. So they go back and report uh, what Esther said. And when they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai said, tell Esther this. Do not think that in the king's palace you're going to escape more than any of the other Jews will. It'll be found out that you're Jewish too, and this law will apply to you. For if you keep silence in such a time as this, and don't seek to intervene on behalf of your people in front of the king, if you keep silence at such a time as this, it may be that relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews for the Jews from another quarter. In other words, God may send someone else to help us. But God isn't mentioned, is it, in the text? God is, again, studiously avoided by the author for some reason. If you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from someplace else. God knows where or how. But I want you to know this, Esther. It may be that for such a time as this, you have come into the royal dignity of being the queen of Persia. Maybe God has intended in his providence that you be there so that this evil can be present, prevented. But the name of God is not mentioned. It just says, for such a time as this, you have come to royal dignity. 
And Esther texts back through these servants, of course, to Mordecai, all right, go and gather all the Jews in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and neither eat or drink for three days. I will do the same with my maids. And after that, after three days of prayer, is prayer mentioned? Not really. Fasting, which is a religious ritual, but is this another one of those non-reference references to God? Probably, but it's very interesting that it's not made explicit. Doesn't say to pray on my behalf. Just says, you do this, and then after that, I will go to the king, although it is against the law to do so. And you know, if I die, I die. I'm willing to do it. I don't know if God's going to intervene or not. If I perish, I perish. This reminds you, doesn't it, of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel and their refusal to bow down to the king and the threat against them is that they'll be thrown into the fiery furnace if they don't obey the king and they say, so what? We don't care. We're not going to obey or bow down to the king as if he were some kind of divine being or God. We won't obey that. And if we die, we die. And they're thrown into the fiery furnace and they don't die in this story in Daniel. And that's very similar to here. Some people think that the book of Esther was written in light of some of these kinds of things in the book of Daniel and, and what happened to Joseph in Egypt. But Esther says, even if God doesn't show up and do what you hope will happen, I'm willing to do it. If I perish, I perish. It doesn't all have to turn out in a positive way. Then Mordecai went away and did everything Esther had ordered him to do. That's the first time Mordecai's taken orders from Esther. She's grown up now. She's taking some adult responsibility. Up until now, she's just followed whatever other people wanted her to do. And it resulted in her being chosen as the queen. But now she's got some power. And she decides on a course of action and asks Mordecai to, to take that action. And then she said, I will do what I will do. So chapter 5 gives us Esther's strategy. On the fifth day, Esther, on the third day, sorry, Esther put on her royal robes, no sackcloth and ashes for her, and stands in the inner court of the king's palace. Now, if you have an apocrypha, a copy of the Greek Esther, additions to Esther in Greek. I urge you to read the preparations that Esther took in the light of the, ed, 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 the additions to Esther uh, that are uh, in Greek Esther. And this would be in Greek Esther chapter 15, which is an insert before our events in chapter 5. And let me read that because it's quite humorous, I think. This is what happens in the Greek Esther. Now, this is written 200 years or so after the Hebrew Esther, we think. So, And it's written in order to fill in explicit references to God that are not in the Hebrew Esther. There are long prayers of Mordecai and Esther herself before she goes in before the king. She prays that God will save her and her people and save her from her fear. And so this is from the Greek Esther now. On the third day, when she ended her prayer, she took off the garments she'd been wearing when she worshipped and she arrayed herself in splendid attire, then majestically adorned after invoking the aid of the all-seeing God and Savior. She took two maids with her, on one, she leaned gently for support, while the other followed, carrying her train. She was radiant with perfect beauty and looked so happy, as if beloved, but her heart was frozen with fear. When she had gone through all the doors, she stood before the king. He was seated on his royal throne, clothed in the full array of all his majesty, all covered with gold and precious stones. He was most terrifying. 
Lifting his face and flushed with splendor, he looked at her in fierce anger. The queen faltered and turned pale and faint and collapsed on the head of the maid who went in front of her. Oh my gosh. Then God changed the spirit of the king to gentleness. And in alarm, he sprang from his throne and took her in his arms until she came to herself. And he comforted her with soothing words. And he said to her, Oh, Esther, what is it, dear? I am your husband. Take courage. You shall not die. For our law, that law about killing people if they come into my presence, that doesn't apply to you. That only applies to the peons in my kingdom, to our subjects. Come near then. And he raised the golden scepter and touched her neck with it. And he embraced her and said, Oh, love, speak to me. And she said to him, I saw you, my Lord, like an angel of God. And my heart was shaken with fear at your beautiful glory. You are so wonderful, my Lord, and your countenance is full of grace. And while she was speaking, she fainted again and fell. And the king was agitated, and his servants tried to comfort her. And the king said to her, What do you wish, Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half the kingdom. Well, that brings us back to Hebrew Esther, uh, which didn't have all of that wonderful dramatic um, portrayal of Esther's preparations and coming into the king and fainting and him rescuing her. Um, I think it's absolutely delightful. And of course, the the story is read at Purim and it's read in the Greek Esther version. Uh, and people would love to have uh, heard all of that uh, extra material added so that they could sympathize with Esther and and uh, and and also enjoy the drama uh, of the the way it's been portrayed. And so Esther comes in before the king and he holds out the scepter to her in the Hebrew Esther. We're back in chapter five of Hebrew Esther and said to her, what is your request? I'll give you anything you want, anything within reason, up to half my kingdom. And she said, well, all I really want to do is invite you to dinner. Um, seems like quite of an anticlimax to me. Let the king and Haman come to a banquet today that I've prepared. And so the king said, well, that sounds good. Bring Haman quickly and, and let's do what Esther wants. And so the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther prepared. And the king is enjoying his wine and says to Esther, well, you must have something in mind. Uh, what's going on here? What do you really want? And again, I, I'll give you anything you want up to half the kingdom, you know. And Esther said, well tell you what, why don't you come to a banquet tomorrow uh, and then I'll tell you everything that uh, I have in mind and and I'll, I'll obey the king and do what you've said. And, and so apparently the king says, well, that's cool. And so Haman goes out very happy and in good spirits uh, until he saw Mordecai at the king's gate. And he observed that Mordecai neither rose nor trembled before him as everybody else did, and that infuriated him with at Mordecai, verse 9. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. And he called for all his friends and his wife, Seresh, and recounted to them the splendor of his riches, not the king's riches, but his riches, the number of his sons, all the promotions with which the king had honored him, and how he advanced him beyond all his officials and ministers, and added that even Queen Esther, let no one but myself come with the king to the banquet that she has prepared, and tomorrow I'm invited by her exclusively to another banquet with the king. But you know, all of this just doesn't do me any good at all as long as I see that blankety-blank Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate, who doesn't bow down to me. And his wife said, you know, you could take care of that problem yourself. Why don't you just tell the king to hang the guy? Build a gallows and tell the king, hang the guy. He'll listen to you. You'll get what you want. Cool, said Esther. That's a good plan. I think I'll do that. I'll have the gallows built and I'll go to the king tomorrow and tell him, hang that SOB Mordecai who doesn't obey our laws on the gallows. I'll do that. And it pleased Haman and he felt better now. I'm glad you know that. That he, I'm glad you're glad that he felt better, right? So now on to chapter 6. And it just so happened 
I love this just so happened stuff. We saw it in Ruth, right? And the, that Boaz goes out to the gate. He's going to intervene on Naomi and Ruth's behalf. He goes to the gate and it just so happens that the kinsman he has to talk to walks by. Amazing. What a coincidence. And of course, that's another one of these God in the background things that our author of uh, Esther is also practicing. It just so happened on that night that the king couldn't sleep. And he gave orders to bring the book of the records. This is what you, this is like the phone book that you want to read when you can't sleep and and, uh, and you want to fall back to sleep by reading something absolutely boring, you go back and you read the annals of the, uh, annals of the empire, um, and uh, it will certainly put you to sleep. And that's what he was hoping, and they were read to him. He didn't do his own reading. We don't even know if he could read. He's portrayed as a kind of bumbler, so maybe he had to have people read to him as well. Anyway, they were read to the king, and just so happened again, that they found this passage where Mordecai had told about the two eunuchs of the king who were conspiring to assassinate him. They just happened to read that very passage. And that caused the king to say, well, I wonder what distinction or honor has been given to Mordecai for doing this on my behalf. And they said, not a darn thing. Nothing has been done for Mordecai at all. Oh, said the king probably need to do something about this. Anyway, who's who's come into the court? It's probably morning by now. Maybe they had to read a long time. Anyway, it's unlikely Haman came at night. Uh, so the next morning, as the king has just read this passage, Haman shows up in court with the purpose of speaking to the king about having Mordecai hanged on the gallows that Haman had had built. But the king doesn't know that. And so the king says, uh, Haman's standing here in the court. And the king said, oh, good. He's my top advisor. He'll have some good idea about what we should do for Mordecai. So let him come in. And so Haman came in, intent on telling the king to kill Mordecai in the way that Haman wanted. And the king said to him, I have a question for you, Haman. What shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor? What should we do for him? And Haman we learn a lot about his character here. Haman says, well, it has to be me. Who else would the king want to honor? Uh, I'm the greatest in the kingdom other than the king. So whom would the king wish to honor more than me? So Haman tells the king, here's a plan. Here's what you should do for the person that you want to honor. We all know it's really me, but he doesn't say that out loud. For the man whom the king wishes to honor, let royal robes be brought, which the king has worn. This is like, you know, giving him Russell Wilson's jersey that he wore when he threw the touchdown pass that won the game. Not the one he threw that got intercepted when we lost the Super Bowl. We don't want the, you know, we don't want Mordecai wearing that jersey. Uh, but one of Russell Wilson's autograph jerseys would jer work just fine. So the robe that you have worn as king, one of those robes which you have worn, and a horse that you've ridden on, a car that you've actually driven yourself, although you probably were driven in it by your chauffeur, a, a horse that the king has ridden, and a royal crown on its head. I don't know if this is the head of the horse or the head of the person riding on the horse, but it does say uh, the horse, the royal crown on its head. And, and, I, and I think there are actually pictures in some um, hieroglyphs or some archaeological evidence that horses occasionally wore crowns, royal horses. Anyway, let the robes be brought and the horse be brought and handed over to one of the king's most noble officials and let, the, let him robe the man whom the king wishes to honor and let him conduct the man on horseback through the open square of the city, proclaiming to everyone within hearing Thus it shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. And the king said to Haman, and this is a wonderful reversal verse, isn't it? A wonderful verse. And the king said to Haman, do that, do that. Take the robes and the horse, just as you've said, and do it for Mordecai the Jew who sits at the king's gate. Holy cow. Leave nothing out that you have mentioned. 
And so Haman took the robes and the horse and robed Mordecai, whom he hates, and led Mordecai riding through the open square of the city, while Haman proclaimed, Thus it shall be done for the man whom the king wishes to honor. Hmm. And Mordecai returned to the king's gate after it was all over, probably having taken off the king's robe and giving it back and putting on his sackcloth and ashes again. And Haman returned to his house. Now it's a very different homecoming than the last one we read about in chapter 5. Haman returns to his house and to his wife, who reminds me of Job's wife. Uh, from the book of Job, why don't you just uh, curse God and die, she says in the book of Job. And here Zeresh says to him, after Mordecai tells her everything that's happened to him, she says, well, if Mordecai, before whom your downfall, you idiot, has begun, if he is of the Jewish people that you want condemned, you will not prevail against him. You see, you know, the stars are not aligned for you. Uh, Haman, you will surely fall before him. So a very encouraging wife uh, that uh, Haman has, very encouraging, encouraging advice that she gives to him, saying, you're, you're a loser, buddy. It looks like you're on a slippery slope to destruction. And that's where chapter 6 ends, and that's where we end today. But I need to tell you something. Uh, and that is that uh, we will not have a class next Monday in person or a video next Monday. So uh, we will not meet either online or in person next week. Michelle and I are traveling. We'll be gone next week. But I will this week send out study questions so I don't have to write them while I'm on vacation. Uh, so I will send out study questions for the rest of Esther, chapters 7 through 10. And, but we won't have a class or video on those study questions until, what is it, the 15th uh, of May, the second Monday in May. Let me take a look at my calendar here. Yes, uh, this is May 1st. We won't meet May 8th, but we will meet again to finish the book of Esther on May 15th. So if you're watching this video, that's when the next video should be sent to you is May 15th. But in the meantime, you'll have study questions to finish the book of Esther. Now, what comes after Esther? Well, the group voted this morning. It was divided, uh, but a clear majority voted to do the book of Acts next, to go back to the New Testament and to take up the narrative that Luke wrote in part two of his story of the rise of early Christianity. And uh, he's finished book one in the life, death, resurrection of Jesus. And now he's starting uh, at during the resurrection, the post-resurrection period. And he takes it uh, all the way through Paul's arrival in Rome in Acts 28. So we will be doing the book of Acts next. You can begin to collect uh, commentary material that will help you with the study of Acts. Uh, again, I recommend a good study Bible that will provide some of that commentary for you, but there are other excellent commentaries on the book of Acts, affordable, um, and I will send out uh, some advice about uh, what, what commentaries might be the best to use for the book of Acts. Uh, but again, you can go ahead and do that on your own and prepare for uh, our study of Acts after uh, the study of the book of Esther, which will conclude on the 15th of May, I hope. We'll see. Uh, I think we can get through that end of the book uh, to find out what happens to Esther and the Jews and how they came to celebrate Purim. Thank you for being a part of the study of the Monday study group. I wish you well, and I'll see you in a couple weeks. God bless.